any extra opportunity to do it just a moment, but I do want to note a couple of things about doing that. She, uh, Seattle University person, in many respects, uh, it's sort of amazing. She got her BA here in communications and journalism in 2007, and then she followed that up with her master's in nonprofit leadership. So she launched Norwex Candles in 2020, and she won the Jones Progress Award last year university as the director of education partnerships. So everyone knows that one way to realize your entrepreneurship dream is to do it out of sight, right? That's one good way to do it. And that's what Alina has to our mind. She's going to talk to us about that tonight. So maybe we should agree that we won't tell her employer what she said about <laughs> when she's going to Jump ship and go full time with your entrepreneurship dream. That's done. Good? Okay. So, shh, don't say anything. Okay. Sorry. Um, we trust for this. Um, seriously, though, we should be so lucky to have somebody with such a deep connection to our community here and to have her share her entrepreneurial experiences with us. She came here as a student. And she continues to help students across the entire Seattle community in her job, in her full-time job. And she's imbued her strong sense of community and social impact into everything she does at Norwalk Campbell. You can see that in her product. And she'll tell you in that story. And I'm so excited to learn more. So, Camille, welcome. So, can you tell us? So, here's the mic. And it's flipping up. Spend a few minutes telling us about your company and how to start. Sure. Well, you can. I did give a shout out to my boss. Ah. <laughs> 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 I'm only kidding about the number. <laughs> <laughs> and the K-12 team, um, the local support guys, the after the event, the team, and my mom this year. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> So, um, just to share a little bit about my journey. So, um, as I was mentioning, I launched more or less last year in the midst of the pandemic. Um, a lot of folks asked me, like, how have I set candle making or what led me on my journey? Um, it really was just like wanting to practice stuff here. I burned a lot of candles. I was getting this from being lost and, you know, cheap little candles. Um, that's the dip of quality, but I was not paying for candles like that. Um, and so I started thinking, like, oh, I could probably make these. I have time. Um, and I always say, you know, I wasn't going to start this. I wasn't doing my happy hours, so I had a little bit of extra money. Um, so I, I took, you know, what I had to get, you know, the least amount of supplies and material that I could uh, to just try to make as many candles as possible. Um, and it was definitely trial and error, but I really started just by sharing my candles with my friends and family. Um, and people were like, oh, you smell really good. You should think about, you know, really selling these. And so that was kind of the first um, push for just knowing that, like, I had a product that people responded well to, um, that smelled good and that burned well. And um, so I kind of went from there. So I've been doing that since September last year. Thank you. Yeah. I'm all that confused about that. No, it's not. And I hope I didn't get into trouble with Paul. No, so, and I, I'll make some jokes about it later. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you mentioned the pandemic. You started during the pandemic. So can you talk a little bit about how the pandemic sounded like it might help you? Maybe more than hindered you. So talk a little bit about that. I would say there are definitely, you know, there are definitely very horrible parts of the pandemic, and there was also uh, a gift for some of us. For me, it sat me down. Like, I'm a person who always just said yes to everything. If I have extra time, I try to do it. And so having the time to sit down and, and have a little bit of extra time um, gave me an opportunity to think about something that I enjoy doing that I can monetize. So I think that's what kind of led me. And then the flexibility of working from home during that time, Get up in the morning, four candles, get on my knees, um, and then afterward I was commuting home. So 
for your candles. Like usually when you're getting home from work, that gives you an opportunity like to eat the from your day. Um, but for me, like for candles, it's like eat the welcome to the day. Um, or I believe in like aromatherapy and like aroma being nostalgic is taking you to different, you know, places in time and bringing up good memories and things like that. And um, scent is like associated with, you know, can be associated with good things. So, um, so that was my, you know, process. It sounds to me a little bit like you when like, I guess I didn't have a lot of air between work life and your home life during this time. You just work all the time. That is true. Um, I would say I am very grateful for my husband, who is, um, we have two kids, we have a 12-year-old and uh, a three-year-old, so our house is very busy, <laughs> um, but he definitely, you know, provided opportunities for me to be able to work a little bit later, um, so, you know, I always equate it to having, you know, two full-time jobs for me. Well, we're getting into all of these success, you know, so. Um, 
also got some mentorship from the Java Progress Awards last year, so I'm wondering if you might share and sort of coming into a new season of that program. Yeah, um, my experience was really great. I had some coaches who um, I met with regularly once a month, but then also were just available to have family meetings when we check in about anything from um, just looking at my cause and my figure that out to financial credentials. Like, there's a lot of things that I kind of did backwards. I got into the business, I started selling candles on my camp, selling candles, and then I'm like, I'm just making any money. So what's happening here? And so we kind of looked at, you know, my um, that was my business model, but just looked at like where am I getting my um cost I mean, where am I getting my supplies from and how can I optimize my supply chain in a way where you know I'm not ordering eight times in one month from the same vendor. I'm ordering one huge order that's gonna save me, you know, on each individual item or the same on shipping or that sort of thing. Um, I would say one challenge that I've expressed is that I've um, did not have a coach that was a person of color. So I would just love to see that and would also just like share with you all and if you all know. I mean, there are a number of, you know, very talented people of color in this field, I'm sure. So if there um, are any folks in you all's network who be willing to be a coach, I think it would be tremendously valuable. Um, just because I'm a woman of color myself, I was really wanting to maintain my voice, but also, you know, I knew that these coaches had expertise that I didn't have, and they and they were providing resources that I didn't have. So um, that was a little bit of a challenge, but other than that, I had a really, really great experience. Uh, one example is that my coaches kept encouraging me to raise the price of my candle. Um, I started selling my candle at fifteen dollars, and um, based on my cost of goods and the price of my candle, I wasn't really, I didn't have a great profit margin. Um, and I think, you know, in addition to having profit syndrome, I had some friends who had said, like, $50 is a lot for a candle. And so that just, like, stuck with me from the beginning. And I was like, okay, if I charge more than $50, it's a lot for a candle. And every month, a million was like, <laughs> and I was like, no. And so finally, I got to the point where like, I upgraded my vessel. We call it our vessel in the candle world. Um, I upgraded my vessel and I upgraded my branding and my packaging. And I was like, okay, I'm going to price this at what I think it's worth. I'm also looking at other candles online. And I think my candle is as good or better than those candles, and they're charging more than I am. So I just said, I'm going to charge some more than those. Um, and so that's been great. Well, that's a great story about mentorship. And I love how you push back on, on mentorship because I think you know one of the beautiful things and also one of the hard things about mentorship is you get conflicting advice. And, but you, you get to pick which is what you pick. Yeah, I think um, I kind of relate that to my experience in the education sector. Like when we're working with our scholars, we're providing, you know, different tools for them, and we're basically creating a school basket for them. But they get to choose which school they take out of the basket. But they have access to those tools and those resources. So I see them in the same way. So we're going to go to questions from the audience. I'm sure they have some. That they want to ask you. I uh, I do want to know, you know a little bit more about what your plans are going forward. And I, I'm you know, we talked a little bit a couple of days ago about uh, taking it to the next level. And I'm I was asking you questions about how you do all this on your own. And, and now that I know that you put your whole family to work, <laughs> um, that sort of answers some of the questions. But uh, you know, I was asking questions about what, what you think you look for in the team, what your team, what you think your strengths are. I wonder if you might comment on you sort of taking it to the next level for a lot of us and bringing on team members. What would be the ideal partner for you? Sure. Um, so currently, I have an intern who is paid through um, youth care. So they work with me for 80 hours over the next couple of months. and um, I, I think my challenge 
is that this is like my baby, and so it's really hard for me to not do everything. Um, like either, you know, my husband will be like, let me put a, like, a label on a candle. I'm like, oh, that's okay. Just because I'm like, it has to be straight, precision. Uh, so I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. My team might be able to speak to that a little bit. But, um, but I feel like because of the care that I put into my product, people feel that when they get their box. Like every, I've had over, 1300 orders in September. I process every one. I've written a handwritten note in every single box. So there's not been one box where someone they pay to thank you so much for your support for me. Um, so I think that's important. I think that people buy from small businesses because they know that they're supporting an individual or a family. Um, and so, yeah, the challenge is like just being able to let go of something. Um, I would say for me, my expertise would be around it. Design process of it, um, and then you know I could have somebody else potentially selling candles or working on marketing or you know with areas where I have gaps, but it's just so hard, very hard. Yeah. I know. I but I will say I'm currently in the process of just figuring out what my what my next steps are. Um, I'm not planning to leave in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always, um, a lot of people ask me like, you know, how do you do, you know, both things? And we even talked about this. Like some people say, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a hundred percent invested in your business. And for me, that's not the reality because my day job pays my bills, um, and it is also something that I love to do. I Literally been in the nonprofit sector my whole life. I've you know been at SU for a majority of my life. So uh, I've been working here for this is my seventh academic year. So um, just walking away from that to pursue your dream is definitely you know it takes courage um, and also it takes financial stability which you have to build up to. So um, I'm definitely you know in the process of figuring out what my next steps are. Um, I would love to initially have a brick and mortar. And um, my my business model is not so much as like having people come in and buy candles, but um, I would love to have a candle bar where people can come in, you know, for every to make their own candles and maybe with their own creation. Um, I know that's not like a unique idea. There are other candle bars, but um, I would be the first black owned candle bar in Seattle. Um, and I think that's cool because also a part of my business model is. And when I do when I do do my brick and mortar, so manifest it, um, that the space will be a multi-purpose, multi-functional space. So other vendors can come in and sell their items, and we can have pop-ups, and we can have events and workshops and classes. So um, that is also something that I'm very passionate about. I'm a product of the visual district. My mom and her nine siblings grew up down the street. They all went to Garfield. Um, she also owned a, a salon in the Mitchell District for a very long time, and due to the gentrification, um, they ended up leaving and working out of her home. But like, if we were able to return back to the Mitchell District, that would be a full circle moment for me. So. Wonderful. So why don't we go uh, questions? I'm sure folks in the audience have questions for Karina. So Amelia is going to come around with the mic. Hey, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. So we met in Salad Club, and uh, you at that time wanted to get into more friends. People are connected. Anyone connected to more friends? Yeah. Anyone know I know the truth of something? Thank you. It, it's really hard, so um, I should share. I was pretty to share this, but it's kind of important. Um, so in February, I was featured in Oprah Magazine. Oh, really? yeah. <laughs> I was featured as one of the 25 best black old candle companies. And people always ask, like, how did you get into Oprah Magazine? And I literally just went, I started looking at those roundups where they say, like, 20 candles we have to own. And I looked at the editor and I'm like, okay, 
Um, and so when you have all these different options, um, it makes it hard to kind of focus on like quality um, if you are focusing on quantity, right? So um, I'm also like I have a, I have a number of fragrances that don't really sell that well, but I haven't gotten rid of them because there's like one or two people who still buy them. Um, and so that's also a challenge, is like figuring out how to phase things out um, in a way that makes sense. And so, so to answer your question, I have thought about it. I haven't completed it because I'm still trying to figure out how to like, <laughs> have a reasonable number of candles. Uh, but I have tried to say that the car oil diffuser, they're amazing. You, I can give you an oil in the diffuser and you just hang it in your car and it well, it's not amazing for 30 days. So. And the second question around marketing. Um, I have tried paid marketing and advertising. I my website platform is through Lit and they have a um, like Facebook and Instagram plugin. And so you pay like an extra fee to Lit and then they kind of create some marketing um templates, not campaigns, but templates for you. Um, and I'm at a very, very low level. It's like something like $125 a month or something. Um, so I think that in that regard, it doesn't bring me new customers. Um, I would say the thing that's helpful is that it will pop up on um, folks who have shopped with me before. And so they're scrolling on Facebook and they're thinking about candles. And then my ad pops up and they're like, oh, I need to go get some more candles. Um, but it hasn't necessarily brought in a new customer. So that is a gap for me and something that I can do some help with is figuring out marketing and advertising in a um, cost effective way. Hi, I'm Wendy. Thanks for being here. So you might have already answered this question, but are you doing all the manufacturing yourself? You are making every single panel, every single label, everything. Wow. Yeah. So when I started um, this company, I started with just literally the bare minimum. So I was going to Staples, I was buying labels from Staples, and then I create them in Canada, and then I go back to Staples and get them printed. Um, I kind of still do the same thing, although I order my labels from Avery, still create them in Canvas, and then my husband actually takes them my labels. Um, in terms of the actual candles, they're all handcrafted. Um, I put them in batches of eight, and yeah, they're made to order for the most part, so um, I typically don't have an inventory sitting around, but for instances like this, I will make you know, 10 to 15 different fragrances that seem to be selling well. Um, it's also really different because people, um, people buy things online based off what they think they like, but they buy things in person based off the impulse or like what smells good to them right there. Um, and so I would say data says that like 60% of people who buy candles prefer to buy the same line. I mean, sorry, in person. Um, and so I'm like, huh, there's a market that, you know, I'm missing. Um, but all that to say, yeah, I'm, I'm at the vendor market selling candles. Sometimes I have, like, my family will come sit with me or I have my intern will come. Um, and maybe eventually I'll, like, hire some sellers in that part. But, yeah. Thank you.
how many folks are returning? I would say 80% of my customers right now are I have a question. I have a spot. Okay. I just walked in this place. This dude. The father took me around the corner. He showed me a baby spread. You just said he was Why would you just put the spreader right here <laughs> in your maker space? And you can put them out while you're working. I'm to go home. There you go. Can you turn around and uh <laughs> But if you're LLC, you know, 
know, they would be seeing your your business or your company. So um, I that is something that I'm looking into. I did not start that way because it was just me and I didn't have any um, employees or staff or anything. Um, one thing that I just found out really is that um, when you file your business license, you get a reseller's permit. And so for the past year, I did not know that, and I've been paying tax on everything that I've been buying, um, which I should be taxed in. And so basically, I've been paying tax twice. Um, so that's, you know, there's just little things that it's like, oh, I'm sure somebody could have told me that, but I really didn't know. Um, so I think those would be the main thing. I did um, hire an accountant pretty early on to um, just kind of track finances and look at, you know, um, all, of, all of that stuff. So, because that's something that I'm not great at. Um, and also, I always include a warning label on the candle. It doesn't um, really save you from anything, but it also just says, you need to burn your candle safely, you need to not walk away from it, that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, there's probably a lot of stuff that I still don't know. I think it's time to maybe one more question. Oh, yeah, two right at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we have time for two more questions. Hi, Gina, thank you so much for being here. Uh, so, I had a quick question that when you basically together with the cannabis and then from there you start the business. What do you say was the most difficult part for you to like overcome in walking there? Yeah, I think the most difficult part, so as I mentioned, I'm still working full time. And so just trying to find a work life balance and trying to figure out like, like currently I get up very early. I start pouring candles, processing orders. I work, you know, all my lunches on pouring candles at night on processing. So it's still really hard because, like, um, yeah, it's a lot for one person to do. Um, I would say the other thing that was hard for me to figure out was shipping um, because candles are, they can be heavy. So if you're shipping one candle in a four or five, four or six box, I was like, one count four ounces. But if you're shipping, um, you know, six candles, initially I was just shipping one candle. But then now most of my orders are at least four to six candles. Um, so I have to figure out, you know, how much I'm going to pay for shipping. Um, and so I initially pursued a, um, a commercial shipping um, platform that goes through Kit and Bows. And the challenge is that they don't tell you, like, if your item weighs this much, you should ship it in this box. Or if your item is this big, you should ship it in this box. So not knowing, when I first started, I was shipping everything in flat rate boxes. So that means, but I literally paid like three or four times as much as I should have been paying um, just because I just didn't know. I found out like I can get a regional box. So if I ship it in a regional A box, that's the same size as a medium flat rate box. It's going to cost me $14 to ship it in a flat rate box, and it's going to cost me $8 to ship it in a regional A box. So just little things like that. Now I know, like, I look at something, I look to see where it's going, I can kind of know, like, what it's going to be, how much it's going to weigh, how much it's going to cost. Um, but, yeah, again, just, like, not, not knowing. Yeah. Hi. Um, where do most of your sales come from? Online, then, or street fairs? Yeah. I would say so. Majority, all well, the majority of myself are online. However, in person, I have really good days. So typically, when I do a four to six hour market, um, I'm usually paying like at least a hundred, like hundred or hundred fifty dollars to be there. I usually make about a thousand dollars in that time frame. So. Um, so I try to do three or four markets a month, although that means I work every weekend. Um, but also, you know, just that opportunity for people to smell in person is invaluable. So even if they don't buy, they'll get a business card, they'll tell somebody else about it. Um, yeah, so currently it's, it's um, online, but when I have my first morning, I can still be in person. Okay. 